So, hi everyone, and thank you for joining this presentation today about Zio Prelude. And the title of it is A Prelude of Purity, Scaling Back Zio. So, my name is Jorge Vasquez, and I'm a Scala developer at Scala and Zio Prelude contributor. So, today I'm going to be talking about Zio Prelude. And Zio Prelude is a Scala first take on functional abstractions. So, it offers us type classes to describe the ways different types are similar smart types for more precise data modeling, and data types that complement the Scala standard library, such as Zipure. And today I want to be focusing on that. So what's the problem I want to discuss about today? Is the following. Using purely functional style, how can we write computations that are stateful, require a context, might fail or succeed with a value, or might produce logs? So for that, I'm going to be implementing a very simple uh, problem here, a reverse Polish notation calculator. So the idea of an RPN calculator is very simple. So for example, I have here an RPN expression where they are basically arithmetic expressions where numbers are written before operations we want to apply on, on them. And here's the algorithm to solve the problem, very simple. Every time I receive a number, I put it into a stack. So for example, here, these two, I put it into the stack. I receive a five, I put it into the stack. I receive a plus operator. So I sum the, both uh, numbers that are already present in the stack. I get seven. Then I receive a three, put it into the stack, receive a times, multiply values into the stack. I get 21, receive a one, put it into the stack, and finally receive a minus. So I subtract the numbers into this in the stack and uh, return the corresponding result. And that's the result of the expression. So that's basically the algorithm we need to implement. So for that, I've done several attempts. The first one will be using the cat's state monad. So for that, uh, here I have this stack type that's simply a list of integers. I have also this effect type that will be basically the state monad, where the state is this stack uh, type. And here I have some auxiliary methods to pushing uh, elements into the stack and to popping elements from the stack. They are very simple. I'm not going to go into uh, details. And here is the uh, another helper function to simply process the original expression that's just a string and uh, separate it into its uh, different elements. So here is the core solution to the problem. So here I have my eval RPN expression method that takes a list of elements and processes each element with this function. That's very simple. It checks if an element of the expression is an operator or a number. So if it is a, a number, it simply uh, will push it into the stack. And if we have an operator, we have to process the elements in the stack. So here I also have this method to process elements in the stack, very simple. I just pop two elements from the stack and push the result of operating on them back into the stack. So now with these helper methods, I simply traverse on the list of elements with this process element function. And at the end, I pop the element into the, in the stack that contains the result. And that's the basic idea. So if I evaluate this expression, for example, I get minus six and that's good. That's what was expected. But if I evaluate this malformed expression or this other one that's also malformed, for example, here I'm receiving an A, which is not a number, I'm going to get exceptions. So there is a problem with this solution and it's, uh, it's not looking, looking good because we are not handling errors uh, appropriately. So let's try again. Now I'm going to combine cat's state with either. So instead of uh, handling plain values, plain integers, I'm going to handle the possibility of errors with the uh, either data type. So here uh, the effect type is now this state together with either. And I, for example, here I have my pop method modified to pop elements from the stack. So now every time I want to pop uh, an element, I need to check if the stack is empty or not. And if the stack is empty, I have to return a left value saying no operands are left. But because I'm working inside the state monad, I need to lift this left value into state using a state.pure. And here you can see this not so great type annotation that I needed to write manually because otherwise uh, the application wouldn't compile. So that's not so nice. And here is the core solution. So 
I know what you must be thinking. You can't even read it, right? And that's the idea. So the idea I want to highlight here is that the solution now has become so boilerplated that you can even read it in just one slide as my previous solution, right? So, uh, well, after that, uh, having written that very long logic, now if I try to evaluate malformed expressions, I'm going to get uh, uh, better errors. So that's better than before. So what are the benefits of the solution? Errors are handled appropriately, uh, but there are some problems. There's too much boilerplate to handle those errors. Poor type inference, I needed to write some type annotations manually. So we can do better. So let's try now with monad transformers, another uh, solution we could use. So instead of having either inside of state, I can use the either transformer over state. So that's another possibility, but here, now, for example, if we, if we look at the implementation of this pop method, you can see these awful type annotations here, some stars there, and a lot of calls to this either t dot lift f. So the, the solution is a lot harder to understand and I have to write more type annotations uh, than before. And well, here is the core solution to the problem. Now, again, you can see uh, the whole solution in just one slide. So that's good, that's an improvement over our previous solution. But here, for example, in this line where I'm checking if a number I'm trying to push to the stack is really a number, I have to call, for example, this from option with that awful type annotation as well. So that's not so nice, not so ergonomic. So the benefits of this solution is that there is less boilerplate to handle errors. Now I can see the whole solution in just uh, one slide. But there is a still boilerplate, new boilerplate to lift a state into either T, even worse type inference, and using monad transformers will affect performance. And there's also another very important problem, and that's the problem of discoverability. So if I want to handle additional effects, for example, such as the reader effect context or logging, which monad transformers should I add? So that means that uh, the problem of discoverability is related to having to have knowledge about several uh, domains, right? You, you don't just need to know about concrete data types, such as a state or either, for example. You also need to know about which monad transformers to use. And if you use several of them, in which order you are going to use them, right? And also you need to know about type classes because the CATS ecosystem uses type classes a lot. So there is a lot of things you need to learn uh, because of this design of monad transformers. So that's a problem. So we are not quite there yet. What about using ZO2? So now we can use ZO to solve this problem. So here I have this stack type, now will be a list of integers, but inside a ZO ref. And now my effect type will be just ZO, where the environment is this stack type I want to uh, keep updating. It can fail with a string or succeed with an A value. So now this pop method, you can see it's a lot nicer than before. Uh, I don't have awful type annotations. If I want to fail, I can just call zio.fail and that's it. And the core solution again fits in just one slide. But again, if I'm trying to process numbers, for example, here, if I'm receiving something that's not a number, I can simply, simply call or else fail, right? Uh, without any weird uh, type annotations. So the benefits of ZO2, it's that it's just one monad to rule them all. You can have all effects in just one data type with superb type, type inference, discoverable functionality, because now you have just one data type with concrete methods. You don't need to know about monad transformers. You don't need to know about type classes and things like that. And here I'm comparing the monad transformer solution with the ZO2 solution. And here you can see, well, there is a big difference, right? Uh, the ZO2 solution is a lot easier to understand and I, I don't have those awful type annotations. But there are still some problems with the ZO solution. The problem is that we're killing a fly with a bazooka. So the idea is that we don't need the whole asynchronicity uh, machinery that ZO offers us because we didn't need that in this case. And we don't uh, need to interact with the outside world as well. We don't need to do IO. So because of that, uh, we are also affecting performance somehow. So we are almost there, but not quite. 
So wouldn't it be great if we had a data type that let us scale on the power of ZO2 with the same high performance type inference and ergonomics? And the answer is that yes, there is. And that is a Zipier from ZO Prelude. So Zipier is a description of a pure computation, not uh, including IO, that requires an, an environment of type R, an initial state is one, can fail with an error of type E or succeed with an updated state of type S2 and a value of type A together with some lock of type W. So the mental model of ZPure, you can think about it just as a function that models four effects that a computation can have besides producing a value. So it models the, uh, the effect of errors similar to either, context similar to reader, state similar to the state monad, and logging similar to the writer monad. And I know you must be thinking that, well, Zipier has a lot of type parameters, right? But the good thing is you don't need to use them all at the same type. If you, if you just want to use the state effect, there is a type alias for that. And the same if you just want to use reader or just writer. And there are also type aliases for errorful versions of these uh, uh, cases, such as e-state, it's an errorful state. So it models two effects, a state and errors. And there is similar type aliases for e-reader and e-writer. So now our, our final attempt with Zipier. So now our stack is, again, just a list of integers. We don't need the Z or ref. And now our effect type is an e-state where the state is the stack we want to keep updating and the error type is a string. And now this pop method, you can see its implementation, very simple. Again, if I just want to fail, I can just call estate.fail, very simple. And again, the solution just keeps, it fits inside one slide. And here you can see this line, for example, is very similar to what I did already in Zio. So if I compare the Mona Transformer solution to the Zipier solution, you can see there's a lot of difference. Again, the Zipier solution is a lot easier to understand. And if I compare it with the ZO2 solution, you can see they are actually very similar. So that's very, that's very great news because that means if you already know ZO, working with Zipier is very easy. So the benefits of Zipier, it's one monad to rule almost them all except IO. It also has superb type inference, discoverable functionality, and is zero idiomatic. It has familiar and accessible method names. And you can gradually adopt it. You can use a little at the beginning, then use more, and then more. And it offers us great performance. So I know you must be, you must be saying, uh, you keep saying Zipier is more performance, so show me the proof. And well, here's a quick proof. I've done a quick benchmark of the solutions I've implemented here. And you can see the ZPure solution is a lot more performant than the other solutions, especially the Monad Transformers one. ZO2 is also more performant than Monad Transformers, but because it adds all this machinery for asynchronicity and concurrency and stuff, it's not as performant as ZPure. And take into account that uh, for this case, I'm just combining two effects, right? A state and failure. So what will happen if we added the logging effect, for example? So I've done an experiment of this. I've added the writer monad to my uh, previous solutions. I'm not going to show the code here because there is no time. So here I've done a benchmark again. And you can see if I add the logging effect, the writer effect, uh, the ZPUR performance is basically the same. Also with uh, the ZO2, for example, performance practically doesn't change. Also the first solution, the manual solution, combining manual state writer and either practically has the same performance. Uh, but the Monad Transformer solution, for example, its performance went really, really low. And you can imagine what will happen if we added the context effect uh, to that uh, stack. It will be performance will be even more affected in Monad Transformers, but in ZPure will be practically uh, the same. So in summary, we need a way to handle context, state, failures, and logging in a purely functional way. There are several options, each one with its own limitations. Zipier provides a highly ergonomic, zeodiomatic, and highly performant solution to those limitations. So a special thanks to Cyverge for organizing Zero World, to Scalac for sponsoring the event, and to John DeGos for guidance and support, as always. And thank you, everyone. Here is my contact information if you want to ask any questions uh, later. So thanks again.